consciousness is both the most familiar thing to all of us and one of the most mysterious. Real consciousness, in the eyes of some people, isn't something you could possibly explain. There are even scientists who think, almost by definition, consciousness defies explanation. It is beyond human explanation. If you've explained anything, what you haven't explained is consciousness. Now I want to turn to consciousness itself and some of the more magical phenomena of consciousness. And the first one I want to consider is déjà vu. And this is what Janet said. He said that déjà vu results from an interruption of a perceptual process so that it splits into a past as well as another current experience. And suppose that they arrive at a part of the brain that we're going to call the familiarity detector. Suppose that the signal in channel B got retarded in its passage from the eye to the detector by a few milliseconds. Just long enough for channel A to go through and set up its signature, its footprint, it's been there, and it goes through a novel event, and just a fraction of a second later, in comes the signal from channel B, and the system says, hey, I've seen it before. C-SPAN, it will be streaming over the net. Here's the thing, though. This will all be televised on C-SPAN. And when we are negotiating for that plan, we are going to have C-SPAN on, and you will see who's compromising the American people's interests. Figured. It just does a false positive. It just... Suddenly, it sends the, I've seen it before, signal spuriously up the line. So what do we learn from this? We learn not to trust our own conscious, introspective experience for how these things really work. If you want to know how to explain the magic trick, you have to go backstage and see what's really going on. I, I don't think we ever said, at least I know I didn't say, that there was a direct connection between September the 11th and, 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 and Saddam Hussein. In other words, the brain cheats. And I find that when I say this, some people have the following reaction. They say, not my brain. My brain doesn't cheat. But the point I want to make to you is, you don't know that. You don't know that. You're not entitled to that. This is precisely what you don't know from personal first-hand experience. This is something for science to discover, the extent to which and how and when the brain actually cheats. Now, some of you may be thinking about, wait a minute, this is all very interesting, but there's something fundamentally wrong with it. Uh, what I'm saying is that cognitive neuroscience can be seen as, in effect, reverse engineering the magic show, going to the stage magic show, and showing you how the tricks are actually done, going backstage. I just said that. What needs to be explained, I've said, is, that what, is what the audience thinks happened on stage. And this is, in fact, what I've called heterophenomenology. This is phenomenology of the third-person point of view. You gather lots of evidence about what the audience thinks is happening, and then you have to explain why they think that. And you can do it in your own case, too. There is, in fact, no place in your brain where it all comes together for consciousness. So you have to get rid of the subject, and when you do this, the result has a certain scary, even disgusting feature. It's as if you entered a, a factory and there's all this humming machinery and there's nobody home. That's got to be the case. If your theory does not have that feature, it's got to be wrong. If you still have the watchman there, if you still have the audience there, you haven't begun your theory. If, in short, there's a community of computers living in my head, then there'd also better be somebody who's in charge, and by God, it had better be me. That is as evocative an, uh, an expression of Cartesian materialism as I think I've ever seen. Or how about this from Bob Wright? Of course, the problem here is with the claim that consciousness is identical to physical brain states. The more Dennett and others try to explain to me what they mean by this, the more convinced I become that what they really mean is that consciousness doesn't exist. Daniel Dennett is the devil. <laughs> there is no internal witness, no central recognizer of meaning, and no self other than an abstract center of narrative gravity, which is itself nothing but a convenient fiction. For Dennett, it is not a case of an emperor having no clothes, it's rather the clothes have no emperor. 
Yeah, that's right. Bingo. You got to get rid of the emperor. If you still have the emperor in there, you don't have a theory of consciousness. I can't prove that my way is right, but I can at least tease your imagination some and give you an example which might at least get you to suspend judgment about the way that I'm going with this. And it is another magic trick. And this is a trick called the tuned deck. For many years, Mr. Ralph Hull, the famous card wizard from Crooksville, Ohio, has completely bewildered not only the general public, but also amateur conjurers, card connoisseurs, and professional magicians with a series of card tricks which he is pleased to call the tuned deck. Here is my tuned deck. It is tuned. I listen to the vibrations, buzz, 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 buzz. And by those vibrations, I can tell uh, exactly which card is here, is there because of the different tuning of the vibrations. Here, pick a card, and the card, the card is picked, goes back into the deck, there's some more uh, shenanigans, some more buzz, buzz, and then the card is produced. For years, I've performed this effect and have shown it to magicians and amateurs by the hundred. And to the very best of my knowledge, not one of them ever figured out the secret. The boys have all looked for something too hard. They were looking for a hard problem, not a bunch of cheap tricks. In fact, all the tricks that they were doing were tricks that were quite familiar and in a certain way disappointing. And he hid all this with an elegant title. Now, I do want to suggest, but I don't claim to prove, that when David Chalmers talks about the hard problem, he is innocently playing a trick on himself and others of exactly this sort. He's giving a name to a problem that doesn't even really exist. The problems of consciousness are how all of the various effects work. And once you've got an account of all those effects, that's what Chalmers calls the easy problems, you're home. You've explained consciousness. Because there isn't any further problem, the hard problem, there just seems to be. So here's, again, what Hull says about the tune deck. He says, each time it's performed, the routine is such that one or more ideas in the back of the spectator's head has exploded. Sooner or later, he will invariably give up any further attempt to solve the mystery. Like many scientists and philosophers today, they just say it's mysterious, give up, it's hopeless, you can't do it. Some of us think, no, we can explain consciousness, but we have to, we have to be alert to the fact that many people want consciousness to be mysterious, they don't want it explained, they don't want it to be like stage magic, they want it to be like real magic, in other words, the kind of magic that isn't. So my conclusion is this, that the magic of consciousness, like stage magic, defies explanation only so long as we take it at face value. Once we appreciate all the non-mysterious ways in which the brain can create benign user illusions, we can begin to imagine how the brain creates consciousness.